Hey guys, because of you, the MC's channel is now over a thousand subscribers and growing. And if you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Let's go. This one was a good one. Watch. What if I told you the absolutely true story of a guy whose parents moved his family as a child to Venezuela, abandoning their middle-class American lifestyle to live in a single room, rat-infested shack, all in the service of one of the most infamous cults called the Children of God. And like cults do, there was mental, spiritual, and of course, sexual manipulation in which in one way or another, this guy was a witness to. Finally realizing what they had gotten themselves into, in 1978, they left as fast as they could on the only transportation they could find, hitching a ride on a freighter. And this goes on and on, sleeping in cars, not knowing where his next meal is coming from. And at the age of 19, his brother died of an overdose. He was the one that called the ambulance and watched as they took his brother away for the last time without even a goodbye. Did you guess who? Oscar winning, Golden Globe winning, Grammy award winning, multi-millionaire Joaquin Phoenix. His story is just one of many artists going back hundreds of years and crossing all disciplines of art who suffered extraordinarily, but also made some of what is universally recognized as the greatest art we know. Welcome to the MCs, music at the core of everything. My name's Julia, and today we're asking, do you really have to suffer for your art to be great? Let's find out. Listen to this. I used to get high just to get by. Used to have to puff my L in the morning before I could fly. Ate something. Couple of 40s made me hate something. I did some Now I'm ready to take something. Three years later showing signs of stress. Didn't keep my hair cut or give a f how I dressed. I'm possessed by the darker side. Living the cruddy life. Like this kept a with a bloody knife. Want to make records but I'm it up. I'm slipping. I'm falling. I can't get up. DMX, considered one of the greatest rappers of all time, wrote that at the peak of his fame and fortune. He died on April 9th, 2021, plagued by the same demons he wrote about over two decades later. Two decades earlier. Yeah, he, he wrote, he wrote, <laughs> he wrote that music two decades after he died. That makes sense. But listen closer to the words of that rap. Don't they remind you of someone? <laughs> That's right, Beethoven. Yeah, I said it, Beethoven. Beethoven would regularly be seen walking through German streets, wearing two week old clothes, hair uncombed, flying in every direction, seemingly possessed by some dark entity <laughs> as he talked to himself ignoring the actual humans in front of his face, vying for his attention. And what did DMX call it? Living the cruddy life? Riddled with pain and most likely on drugs? We're talking like 15th century drugs? Yeah. Everyone in his time knew he was a musical genius, contracted by nobles, educators, leaders of the highest order, women and men of all classes and nationalities that had the resources to hear his music, also watched his downfall, the same way people watched DMX's, and were touched and moved by his music in a way that nothing else at the time could do. Why are we drawn to art born from suffering like this? Well, it turns out there's a pretty good reason for this based in actual solid psychology. Research has suggested that sad music plays a role in emotional regulation. It evokes pleasant emotions such as bliss and awe along with sadness and is more likely than happy music to arouse the intensely pleasurable responses referred to as chills. Accompanied by the release of hormones such as oxytocin and prolactin, associated with social bonding and nurturing, sad music can facilitate recovering positive mood. 
An added layer to this emotional maze that's already as complex as, let's say, Jamaican fruitcake. Amazing. You guys ever had that? Like, seriously. They ferment like six different types of fruit in jars for months in overproof white rum. Yum. <laughs> it's amazing. But any cake that takes six months to make has got to be good. So where was I? Uh, yeah, okay. Dr. Bernard Golden, the founder of Anger Management Education, tells us that it's really hard to express our sadness and darkest fears and feelings because you don't know exactly how you feel. You feel that you're the only one who has these feelings. You have an inner dialogue that tells you it's weak to express feelings. And you may not be sure which feelings to trust. Well, I propose a fifth reason. Because it freaking hurts. Because crying alone in the bed is the type of thing that needs a medium that can add to the elevated meaning and nuance required to express those things inside that have no words that define them fully. That medium, in this case, is music. But hey, what do I know? Let's go with Dr. Golden's second reason. There is a comfort in knowing that we're not alone in our suffering. We can see that others suffer, and therefore we have hope that it's normal. And if it is normal, then it's understandable and explainable, and if it is explainable, it's not infinite. It can and it will end. We just need someone to hold our hand through it until it's done. Another quote by Christine Baccio, when suffered alone over time, sadness can progress to helplessness or hopelessness. Sad songs counter such deterioration by enhancing a sense of social connectedness or bonding. Misery loves company, right? <laughs> That's why there's a piece of DMX's lyrics that speak to all of us, because we're human and it's inevitable. And Beethoven too, in Appassionata. Appassionata. I did that, that was so Italian. <laughs> I, did even, I, did, I did the hand thing and everything. Beethoven's frantic, agitated pounding of minor and dissonant chords filled with angst and confused tension reminds us subconsciously of that time that we felt that way. We found our comfort in his ability to express that single, indescribable, insane moment we've all felt out loud, validating it in a way for us. And the cost of doing so was unfortunately to engulf himself so entirely without reservation and to be completely vulnerable in his music because that's what we can't do. Well, unless you want to be called crazy or unfit or strange or Beethoven or DMX. They take those shots because they allowed themselves to be vulnerable to that ridicule when, well, we just wouldn't or couldn't. So literally, one's audience may be psychologically predisposed to find music born from that authentic suffering and pain to be more engaging or moving. In that case, we have to say, yeah, you have to suffer for your art if you want it to be great. Except. You see, pain is a part of everyone's life, but so is every other emotion. Lance Garabi, associate professor and assistant director of theater at Arizona State University, says a rule doesn't exist that says artists can only be inspired by their pain. To discover something from a moment of joy, fear, shock, rage, empathy, appreciation, jealousy, epiphany, or suffering, is to become an artist. Great art comes only from those willing to be vulnerable. Amen to that. Think about it. For every artist who died of a drug overdose, lonely on a toilet at the end of a downward spiral played out in the public eye, there were those who took pain as well as happiness and all the things that life has to offer and art brought them through it to a life filled with achievement awards, YouTube documentaries of the amazing life of fill in the blank. Today, if you hear someone talking about suffering for their art, it's most likely a reference to not being able to make a living and they think accepting poverty is a part of art and compromise 
diminishes their pure art form, so they're not going to sell out. Let's call this the Van Gogh syndrome, because most of the ideas of the starving artist comes from the example of the great painter Van Gogh, who supposedly only sold one painting while he was alive, and he dies poor and destitute. His art reflected this exquisite miserableness. And then he's seen years later as one of the greatest artists of all time. But what these sages of the New York subway don't realize is that Van Gogh didn't suffer for his art. He suffered because nobody wanted to be around him while he was alive. According to Hannah Gadsby in her Netflix special, Nanette, you should watch it, love it, uh, people would literally rather cross the street than pass by too closely because he was so uncomfortable to be around. If he sold one painting while he was alive, which more than likely it's not really true, uh, it still wasn't by choice. It was most likely because of his schizophrenic disposition. He most likely was dealing with a slow neuropsychiatric ailment, which affected his moods and social life for years. It wasn't some great unwillingness to compromise and personal choice to suffer that made him great. He was great. He just was bad at PR. The creative professions are high pressured, oftentimes very solitary. You have to have a mean work ethic, discipline, and an ability to self-motivate and self-promote effectively. Talent really isn't enough to succeed. Sadly, most artists fail in this lifestyle because it's just not what they expected, or they equate fame with making a living as an artist. Many of the best artists I know make a living with their art, but they're not famous. Being famous and rich is as much due to luck as it is with talent. And forcing yourself to suffer in order to fulfill some karmic balance that'll get you what you're looking for is just a myth. And it's dangerous. Here's why. The reality for the sufferer is that depression is so debilitating that it's basically impossible to create anything at all. want to make records, but I'm f***ing it up. I'm slipping. I'm falling. I can't get up. Remember when DMX said that? He meant it. He wasted so many deals and chances, it's hard to believe he got lucky enough to make it as far as he did. Beethoven too would tell you that uh, how many more pieces he could have made were he not a manic wreck, erasing entire symphonies just to start over again, just for the 21st time. Frida Kahlo, a Mexican painter, is often seen as another example of the suffering artist, like Van Gogh, but she didn't suffer for her art. She suffered because she was a lesbian in a place and time where that was ostracized. The art, on the other hand, was the tool she used to express and, well, get through her suffering. She suffered, but not for her art. Her art relieved her of her suffering, and that's a completely different thing. So maybe the key to being a great artist and songwriter with a long and happy life is to dare to go to those dark places, but don't make them your home. Research has shown that people suffering from depression, anxiety, or cancer can find relief from their symptoms by expressing themselves through art. Comedian Matt Lucas said it best, comedians don't have a monopoly on suffering, <laughs> but creative people are sometimes fortunate enough to be able to incorporate their most traumatic experiences into art. You don't have to suffer to make great art. The truth is, if you're human, you will suffer, as well as be happy, be scared, and even be in love. But the artist's skill is vulnerability how vulnerable they allow themselves to be in order to face all those emotions that are just really hard to put into words. That's the standard of greatness. We just have to realize that vulnerability can be as liberating to some as it is destructive to others. The real question is, if we all allowed ourselves to be as vulnerable as the artist, would we be better or worse off, personally, as a society, 
Or is it better that a chosen few delve that deep and bear the consequences of all of that for the rest of us? And that, I don't know. Do you? Leave it in the comment section, guys. And as always, thanks for watching. Bye.